about midway between Ramini and Ancona, a little river falls into the Adriatic after traversing one of those districts of Italy in which a vain attempt has lately been made to revive. After long centuries of servitude and shame, the spirit of Italian nationality and the energy of free institutions. That stream is still called the Metero, and wakens by its name recollections of the resolute daring of ancient Rome, and of the slaughter that stained its current 2,063 years ago, when the combined consular armies of Livius and Nero encountered and crushed near its banks the varied hosts which Hannibal's brother was leading from the Pyrenees, the Rhone, the Alps, and the Po, to aid the great Carthaginian in his stern struggle to annihilate the growing might of the Roman Republic and make the Punic power supreme over all nations of the world. These are the opening words to Sir Edward Shepherd Creasy's chapter on the Battle of the Metaurus River during the Second Punic War. The Punic Wars are some of the most studied and influential conflicts in world history, when Rome and Carthage battled throughout the 3rd century BC for supremacy of the Mediterranean world, and a shot for the title of history's greatest superpower. Of course, we know how that turned out, but had it not been for this one battle, things could be very different. The year is 207 BC. The Second Punic War is in full swing, and Hannibal is wreaking havoc on the Italian peninsula. Rome is running out of grain to feed itself, 20% of its fighting age men are dead, and the Carthaginian army shows no signs of stopping. On top of it all, Hannibal's brother, Hasdrubal, has just crossed the Alps and aims to join his brother to finally crush Rome. If this happens, the city would fall, and Carthage would rise to take Rome's place as the seat of power in the Mediterranean. Hasdrubal fights his way through northern Italy, and in the summer of that year, he clashes with two lesser-known Roman generals at the Metaurus River, sealing the course of history. Hey guys, today we're going to be looking at the Battle of the Metaurus River between Rome and Carthage. This is the fourth entry in Sir Edward Shepard Creasy's list of the 15 decisive battles of the world, which he lists in his book of the same name. I've been looking at the various battles Creasy talks about on this channel, starting with the Battle of Marathon and working my way through Syracuse and Galgamela. This is the first battle in the list that doesn't involve the Greeks, and it symbolizes a shift in the geopolitical reality of the world at this time. In this video, we'll be looking at the battle itself, as well as the prelude and surrounding historical context, the weapons, soldiers, and commanders on the field that day, and the impact and aftermath of the battle, as well as looking at what Creasy himself says on the topic. And before we start the video, just quickly remember to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel for more content, as well as follow me and ISRenell on Instagram. First, to understand the Battle of the Metaurus and why it was so important, we need to understand what was going on in the world at the time and why the battle happened. By the 200s BC, the center of power in the Mediterranean had moved west. Alexander the Great's empire fragmented into a bunch of pieces after his death in 323 BC, each controlled by one of his generals. However, none of these smaller empires were able to really get a significant leg up on the others, and as a result, the area from Persia to the Aegean sort of resembled the power structure Europe would have a millennia or so later, with various powerful, smaller entities keeping each other in check. No massive eastern empire threatened them, since Alexander had effectively destroyed the east with his conquests and made it his own. This made having a common enemy possible, and geography made it hard for these empires to expand past what they already were. To the west, however, two powers had developed, and their conflict marked the new superpower struggle in the Mediterranean. On the north coast of Africa, in modern-day Tunisia, lay the city of Carthage. Carthage itself was actually a byproduct of Greek culture, as Phoenician settlers founded the city in 814 BC. Since then, it had become a regional powerhouse, developing its own culture and government from the Greeks, and was expanding around the western Mediterranean, controlling much of the African coast, southern Spanish coast, 
as well as various islands in the sea. The Carthaginians were a seafaring people, and even expanded beyond the Mediterranean, exploring and developing trade networks as far as West Africa, England, and even the Baltics. They were not, however, particularly warlike, and much of the Carthaginian fighting forces were mercenaries or allies. On the Italian peninsula, the city of Rome had sprung to life. According to legend, descendants of the refugees fleeing from Troy after the events of the Iliad and Aeneid, Romulus and Remus founded the city on seven hills after being nursed to adulthood by the she-wolf Lupa. While this probably isn't true, it is true that Rome was founded in 753 BC, probably around 500 years after the fall of Troy, starting as a kingdom, then turning into a republic in 509 BC. Since then, the city had expanded its territory and had become the hegemony of the peninsula, controlling all except northern Italy. These civilizations had a few things in common. Perhaps the most interesting is that both Carthage and Rome were actually republics. Both realms were controlled by elected officials, with constitutional laws and a balance of power. Carthage was admittedly more oligarchic, but nonetheless it was interesting to know that Rome was not the only impetus for large-scale republicanism in antiquity. The two had another thing in common, their desire to control Sicily. This mutual desire started the First Punic War in 264 BC. By this time, Carthage had controlled most of the island, save for its eastern part which was mostly controlled by Syracuse. Rome then gained a foothold on the island and allied with Syracuse to attack Carthaginian territory and take the island. The Romans even developed unique naval attacks to beat the Carthaginians at their own game, and in 241 BC, the Romans defeated Carthage, taking the whole island of Sicily, except for Syracuse, as well as Carthaginian holdings in Corsica and Sardinia, as well as the Balearic Islands. This defeat galvanized Carthage against Rome, and the two powers would uneasily coexist over the coming decades. One Carthaginian family, however, was not keen on this. This family was the Barca clan, headed by Hamaclar, and would later be ruled by his three sons Hasdrubal, Hannibal, and Hasdrubal, a different one. Hamaclar was a general during the First Punic War, and afterwards had consolidated the Carthaginian power in southern Hispania. He made his son Hannibal swear to never be a friend of Rome, and he made it his family's mission to defeat their rivals. However, Hamaclar drowned in 228 BC, and control of Hispania went to his oldest son, Hasdrubal the Fair. Hasdrubal was quite successful, but was assassinated in 221, which allowed for the middle child, Hannibal, to step in. Hannibal, taking the oath his father had made him take when he was nine very seriously, instigated war with Rome in 218 BC when he invaded much of Hispania, including the Roman allied city of Saguntum. Hannibal then crossed the Alps into Italy proper and proceeded to ravage Rome and its allies. Hannibal was a skilled general and was able to handily defeat Rome in open battle, including the destructive Battle of Cannae in 216, where an estimated 67,500 Romans were killed almost 20% of its military-age male population. 216 BC was an awful year for Rome, as on top of the costly battle, many cities in southern Italy and Sicily sided with Carthage, as well as Macedon, forcing the Romans to fight a war on two fronts. Meanwhile in Hispania, modern-day Spain and Portugal, the two powers were clashing in a third Roman front. While Hannibal was wreaking havoc in Italy, his brother Hasdrubal, the younger one that didn't get assassinated, was fighting Scipio, Rome's most well-known and most successful general during the war. Eventually, Hannibal got an idea. Instead of his brother staying put in Hispania, he could invade Italy and join forces with him, creating an unstoppable army to crush Rome. Scipio was aware of this danger and guarded the southeastern Pyrenees mountains, which was the easiest way to pass the treacherous mountains into the rest of Europe. Hasdrubal, however, escaped through the northwest in 208 BC and made his way into Gaul, modern-day France, and settled there for the winter, recruiting a sizable army while he did. The Romans, meanwhile, were mystified as they had lost an entire army. By 207, Hasdrubal reappeared on the Roman radar when he crossed the Alps. Unlike his brother, who had to deal with a lack of infrastructure and hostile natives, Hasdrubal had the advantage of going second, which spared him these hardships. 
the native tribes, now aware that the Carthaginians meant them no harm, actually joined with Hasdrubal, and the rudimentary bridges and other infrastructure that his brother had created years before was still largely intact, allowing for a much faster traversal of the mountains. The Romans were shocked, as not only had Hasdrubal crossed so fast, he actually gained in numbers rather than suffering heavy casualties like his brother. With this surprise in size, Hasdrubal moved down the river Po and besieged the city of Placentia. When the Romans got word of Hasdrubal's entrance into Italy, they began to panic and debated among themselves what to do. The Roman system mandated that that year new consular generals be elected to oversee combat in the various districts of the peninsula, but the Republic was short on options. In the end, the two generals who were elected were Caius Claudius Nero and Marcus Livius. Nero, not the crazy emperor who would come centuries later, was a nobleman of Rome and had some small victories in his resume. Livius, on the other hand, was a plebeian in accordance with Roman election law, and he was the last Roman general to win a significant victory before Hannibal's invasion. However, he was impeached over trumped-up charges of unfair spoiled division among his men, and since then he had felt wronged and distanced himself from the Roman public life. In fact, the only reason that he was elected was that during the assembly, someone had spoken ill of one of his relatives, and he loudly rebuked them and the whole council. Livius made things more difficult by harassing the assembly for finding him guilty in the first place, then by bringing up a feud his own family had with Nero's. Once he agreed to be elected, Livius attempted to allow the grudge to live on, claiming that the mutual hatred between the two generals would incite competition and make them better, but ultimately the Senate forced the two to reconcile. The stage was set for the most important battle in Rome's history. Across the peninsula, the Romans had about 70,000 men. These men were divided into six armies, each of two legions, as well as an additional army to defend Rome itself, and another reserve legion in Capua, in southern Italy. Another 30,000 were serving in Sicily, Sardinia, and Spain, fighting Carthaginian or rebel forces in those areas, and another 30,000 military age men were available in the rest of Italy. This 130,000 men total paled in comparison to the 270,000 men before the war, showing just how bad things were for Rome. Three armies were assigned to the north, and three to the south. Hannibal had fewer men, but had successfully turned much of southern Italy to his side, and was camped in Brutium for the winter. He was spread thin, and while he knew that his brother was in Italy, he wasn't confident enough about his condition or strategy to abandon his holdings to join him. Hasdrubal was in the north, still besieging Placentia. It was decided that Livius would lead the northern armies against Hasdrubal, while Nero would oversee the south against Hannibal. The three armies assigned to the north split up, with one moving to take care of the rebellious Etruscans, another moving to check Hasdrubal, and the third army under the direct command of Livius advancing slower to fight as needed. Meanwhile in the south, Hannibal moved north to Canassium, while Nero checked him with his two armies at Venusia. The 6th Roman army was stationed at Tarentum. In an attempt to outmaneuver the Romans, Hannibal moved around in the south out of Canassium to Luciana, Apulia, and then back to Brutium, then back to Canassium after a regroup once his maneuvering failed to shake off Nero's armies. In the north, Hasdrubal gave up his siege and moved east to Armenium, driving back the Roman armies sent to check him. Even when Livius merged his two northern armies, they continued to retreat to Senna, a town to the southeast of Hasdrubal's troops, who were on the southern bank of the Metaurus River. No faction could make any decisive moves. Hannibal was in too precarious a position to abandon the south without a solid plan, and both the Roman generals were tied up checking the Carthaginians. Hasdrubal had the most favorable position, as he had fresher, more plentiful troops than his brother, and didn't have to act in a defensive capacity. However, the sons of Hamaclar would be much stronger together, so Hasdrubal devised a plan for him and Hannibal to meet in southern Umbria and merge their armies, then attack Rome directly. He sent his messengers to deliver the plan to Hannibal, but when they were near the destination, a detachment of Nero's troops captured them, 
and the plot was exposed with Hannibal unaware that a plan had even existed in the first place. In learning of the plot, Nero decided to take swift and decisive action. Nero aimed to sneak out part of his army from the south to bolster Livius in the north, taking it Hasdrubal quickly before the Barca brothers could unite, all without alerting Hannibal to the reduction in his army. Out of the 40,000 infantry and 2,500 cavalry under his command, he took 6,000 men and 1,000 horse with him on a march north to meet Livius against Hasdrubal. If Hannibal learned of this, he may have been able to take decisive action and defeat a leaderless, smaller army. To mitigate this, Nero left at night and started southward towards Hannibal first, then turned north towards Livius. Earlier that day, he had sent letters to Rome informing them of Hasdrubal's plan. It was illegal for Nero to actually leave the region he was assigned to fight in without permission, but he waived this rule for himself, citing an immediate emergency, and asked Rome to ready its own defensive army and call upon the reserve legion at Capua in case Hannibal attacked Rome. Nero's march was a fascinating event. On the one hand, it was a move of selfishness. Nero proclaimed to his troops that their aid to Livius in the north would deliver them an easy victory, and since they were the ones to unbalance the battle, they would receive all of the glory. On the other hand, he was endangering his southern forces and Rome itself. This was acutely felt in Rome among its people and officials, who had only experienced pain and loss at the hands of the Carthaginians over the last two decades. All decisive moves from them had ended in catastrophe, and with the city near the end of its rope, this would likely be the last. This feeling of despair was not felt in the rest of Italy, however. Nero had sent cavalry detachments ahead of his forces, who went into all the villages and cities and instructed them to put out supplies and rations for the troops so that they could continue their march, much like how there are water stands for hydrating athletes during a marathon. Not only did the Roman soldiers receive supplies, they were greeted as heroes everywhere they went, boosting their morale and even their numbers as many retired soldiers took up arms to fight one more time for Rome. The soldiers marched on day and night, with wagons in the rear serving as mobile rest spots for the wary soldiers. After only a day or two, the exact time is not known, Nero and his forces reached Livius. Once again, Nero's logistical preparation proved impressive, as he timed himself to arrive at night, not alerting Hasdrubal's forces to the sudden influx of troops. To add to the charade, he had his forces camp in the existing tents of Livius' army, so as to make it seem that the size of the Roman army had not changed. The next day, the Roman soldiers arrayed for battle, inviting the Carthaginians to settle the fate of the Mediterranean once and for all. However, Hasdrubal was able to figure out that the Romans had pulled some shenanigans. The army arrayed before him was larger than it had been, and a division of soldiers with dirty armor had appeared. The standards and trumpet sounds he saw and heard also alerted him to the fact that new forces had arrived, and as a result Hasdrubal decided not to give battle instead, waiting in his camp until nightfall to retreat across the Metaurus into friendly territory, where he could resume planning and reopen communications with his brother. However, during the night as he and his army were retreating, Hasdrubal's guides abandoned him after leading them astray, leaving them lost to wander along the Metaurus' southern bank, unable to find a fordable part of the river. By the morning, many of Hasdrubal's men were exhausted and or drunk, especially the Gauls. The Carthaginians' woes were not over, however, as the Roman army had tracked him down and was ready to give battle. Seeing that the only way to survive was with a fight, Hasdrubal prepared for battle. The weaponry, formations, and tactics of Hasdrubal's army was quite diverse, given that the Carthaginian battle ethos borrowed from many different warrior cultures. As we saw earlier, the Carthaginians were a seafaring trade people, and as a result, they outsourced most of the fighting to allies and mercenaries, leaving the Carthaginian men to engage in trade. While the Carthaginians would call on many different peoples throughout their history, the primary groups assembled at the Metaurus were Iberians, Ligurians, Gauls, Phoenici Africans, Balearics, and Numidians. As you can tell, this was quite a diverse group, and as the German historian Arnold Hermann Ludwig Kieran states, it was an assemblage of the most opposite races of the human species from the farthest parts of the globe. 
Hordes of half-naked Gauls were arranged next to companies of white-clothed Iberians and savage Ligurians next to the fair-traveled Nasimones and Lotophagi. So how were these different divisions armed and organized? The bread and butter of the Carthaginian troops at Metaris were the veteran Iberian troops under Hasdrubal, who had fought Scipio in Hispania. These Iberians were armed with the same weapons and armor as the Phoenician Africans, who were from the areas in and around Carthage proper. These troops were armed with Montefortino-style helmets made of bronze and protecting the top of the head and cheeks. The Iberians may also have worn Iberian-style helmets, also made of bronze but only protecting the top of the head and protruding upwards more to afford more protection. Bronze greaves were common as well, and chest protection would often be lenothoraxes, made of linen but affording more mobility than metal. However, many troops would strip dead Romans of their armor, and chainmail hauberks were a favorite prize for the Carthaginian army, as they were very protective and not very constraining. The infantry was further divided into two groups, the Scutati and Setrati. These warriors got their names from the different shields they would use, with the Scutati using a scotum-like shield, large and oblong, usually made of wood, with the Sestrati using a setra, more similar to a buckler-style type shield. For weapons, most Iberians and Carthaginians were equipped with multiple throwing spears, whether they be light throwing javelins or the soliferum, an iron javelin used by infantry and cavalry alike. For swords, they would either equip themselves with a straight sword, sometimes called an espasa, which was essentially where the Romans got the idea for the gladius, or the falcata, a curved, single-edged hacking blade. The falcata was especially popular with cavalry troops, as the heavy angled blade, as well as the secure handle, lent itself to powerful downward swings onto the enemy's head. Both swords were shorter than swords of later eras, ranging between 20 and 25 inches in the blade. The Numidian cavalrymen from northern Africa were famous for riding their horses without saddles and were very mobile and effective against Carthage's enemies. Balearic troops were primarily used as slingers, as they were well known for their skill with the weapon. The Carthaginians also fielded war elephants with Ethiopian handlers. These elephants were used to great effect to charge towards enemy formations and scatter and demoralize the opponent. Their ability to kill was of course very effective with large tusks and heavy legs to stop on enemies, but they were also easily spooked. Sometimes, the elephants would go awry when startled or wounded, and even charge into friendly formations. If this happened, the elephant's handler riding on its neck would drive a spike through the base of the elephant's skull to kill it, preventing it from inflicting further damage. The Carthaginians are believed to have used a now extinct species of elephant called the North African Forest Elephant. This elephant was quite small, only about 8 feet tall. For comparison, the Asian elephants that the Persians and Indians used were about 9 feet tall, and modern African bush elephants are about 10 feet tall. Outside the Carthaginian realms, the weaponry changes. The Ligurians and Gauls, from northern Italy and Gaul respectively, made up significant formations in Hasdrubal's army, as he had recruited many during his trek through their territories. Both barbarian factions were armed similarly, with a spear as the primary weapon and a large, rounded, rectangular shield in Montefortino-style helmets for protection. Armor on the body was rare, but the most prestigious Gauls and Ligurians wore chainmail. The most distinguishing part of the European loadout was the Celtic sword, which was uniquely long for its time, about 36 inches long. These swords had double-edged blades and small grips to be used with one hand, and were made of iron, but not always of high quality. While it is unknown, it is thought that Hasdrubal had about 30,000 soldiers total, likely only around 3 to 4,000 of which were cavalry. Hasdrubal also had 10 war elephants at his disposal. The Romans, interestingly, were not much more uniform or organized in their composition at this time. Similar to the homeland forces of Carthage, the Roman army was a militia where men were called to arms during times of war and went about their normal lives otherwise. The unit of the legion had been introduced earlier in the war and consisted of 4,500 men. 300 were cavalry, 1,200 were light armored skirmisher troops, and the remaining 3,000 were heavy infantry. There were two legions per army, so it isn't hard to estimate the size of Roman forces around this time. The Roman skirmisher troops, known as velites, 
led the legion and started the battle. These velites were armed with 5 to 7 throwing javelins, as well as a parma shield, circular in shape, about 36 inches across, with an iron frame and boss, and a wooden construction. The velites were also equipped with wolfskin headdresses, which distinguished them from the rest of the Roman army and made them identifiable to their generals. Like every other Roman soldier, the velites were armed with a gladius. This early form of gladius, known as gladius hispanicis, or Spanish sword, was effectively copied from the Iberian Carthaginian troops during the war. The gladius hispanicis had a more leaf-shaped blade than later versions of the gladius, and was also longer at around 25 inches in the blade, about 5 inches longer than later versions. After the velites had thrown their javelins, they would retreat behind the main force of heavy infantry, who engaged more so in close combat. The 3,000 heavy infantry were split into three divisions, the Hastati, the Principes, and the Triari. The Hastati, 1,200 strong, were the youngest and newest troops in the legion, usually in their late teens or early 20s. These soldiers carried an early version of the Scutum shield, large and oblong but not as curved as later versions. They were also usually equipped with a Montefortino-style bronze helmet with a red or black mane, and their chest armor varied from a bronze cuirass to a male shirt. At this point in history, the Roman army had not fully standardized, and was in transition with various sorts of weapons and armor as well as tactics. In addition to the gladius, the hastati also carried two javelins known as a pilum. The pilum was a unique style of spear about six feet long, two feet of which was a long, arrow-like head made out of iron, and an iron or wooden stop in the middle of it. The pilum was not just meant to skewer opponents, but with its heavy weight and long barbed head, was able to lodge into enemy shields, making them useless to the user, who would either have to cast aside his defense or deal with a large, heavy stick coming out of it. Like the Velites before them, the Hastati would throw their spears but then engage in close combat with the enemies using their gladius. When the Hastati had grown tired, the second division, the Principes, also 1200 strong, would move forward and take their place, repeating the tactic of the Hastati. These troops were armed in the same way as the Hastati, but were more likely to have good armor as they were older, usually in their mid to late 20s or early 30s, and had more experience and wealth. Behind these two were the Triari, only 600 strong, and quite different from the other two. Armed with a longer spear known as a hosta, around 6 feet long with an iron head. The Roman cavalry was also somewhat of a hodgepodge, but most horsemen, called equites, wore a Montefortino style helmet. The weaponry and armor varied from there, with some cavalry being unarmored, and others wearing mail or bronze. Small, parma-style shields were used by some, along with a spear similar to a hosta, but some opted for a longer, larger lance, sometimes without a shield. The Spatha sword, a longer version of the gladius, may also have been used by some equites, as the Spatha was first introduced during the Second Punic War. For tactics, the Romans at this time used what was called the manipular system, which consisted of smaller units in the legion rather than large lines, so as to increase maneuverability and flexibility. These units were usually 10 men deep, and had about 3 feet between men back and forth to facilitate the use of javelins. The units were arrayed in a quincunx staggered formation, allowing the units in the second line to move up next to and past the previous line, without disrupting the flow. When engaged in combat, these units would meld so as to make a strong line, but would revert to their original formations when retreating or rearranging. As we can see, especially with the weapons and armor of the Romans, they did a very good job at adapting to and copying their enemies. The Iberian-style swords were turned into the Gladius, chainmail was adapted from the Celts, and the Scutum-style shields existed for Carthage, Gaul, and Rome. While Rome was in the midst of transition as a result of war, they adapted better than their enemies and often became a strange mirror image of them. This mirror image did not apply to the force numbers between Rome and Carthage, however. While once again estimates are not exact, it is thought that the Romans went into battle with a total of 37,000 soldiers. About 9,000 were from Nero, who moved north with 6,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry, and it is thought that he had picked up about 2,000 volunteers along the way. Livius had most of the force, although he had lost some troops to Hasdrubal in earlier fighting. In total, the Romans had around 32,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry.
not much to talk about on this part. The battlefield of the Metaris was in northern Italy, near the Adriatic coast, on the southern bank of the Metaris River, which was presumably kind of treacherous. Most of the battle took place on flat, open terrain, but on the southern extremity was a steep hill or cliff, with high ground on one side which the Carthaginians had. Finally, the battle was about to commence. A raid on the east side of the battlefield was Hasdrubal and his troops. On the extreme right of his formation was the Numidian horse, next to Hasdrubal himself and his veteran Iberian troops. In the middle of the formation were the Ligurian troops, and on the far left, protected by high ground and rugged terrain, were the Gauls. This was because the Gauls especially had drank through the night of trying to find a river crossing, and were effectively useless to Hasdrubal. A van of Balearic slingers were in front of the formation, as well as the ten elephants who were in front of the right and center of Hasdrubal's forces. Opposing them were three armies of Rome, led by Livius, Nero, and Lucinius, a lesser general who commanded the advance to northern army under Livius. The Roman cavalry was on the extreme right, next to Livius, while Nero commanded the right, opposite the Gauls in the rugged terrain. The battle commenced, starting with the Roman and Numidian cavalry engaging. The Roman cavalry, larger in size and better organized, easily pushed back their opponents, but due to strong formations of the Carthaginian infantry were unable to really attack the main force. These two units would keep each other busy the whole battle. At the same time, the center and northern flanks of the opposing armies collided, with many casualties on both sides. The war elephants wreaked havoc on the Romans, opening gaps in their formations and terrorizing soldiers. The Iberians and Ligurians were also familiar with Roman warfare, and as a result did better than one would expect, given their inferior organization and armament. Neither side budged, and as Creasy quotes in his book, both Romans and Carthaginians well understood how much depended upon the future of this day, and how little hope of safety there was for the vanquished. The Africans and Spaniards were stout soldiers, and well acquainted with the manner of Roman fight. The Ligurians also were a hardy nation and not accustomed to give ground, which they needed the less or were able to do now, being placed in the midst. Livius, therefore, and Porcius fought great opposition, and where the great slaughter on both sides prevailed little or nothing. Meanwhile, on the Roman right flank, Nero was spared the bloodshed of the rest of the army by the steep hill in front of him. Because of it, he was unable to effectively engage the Gauls, and since the Gauls were drunk, the Romans weren't really being attacked either. Once again, Nero found himself in a rather useless position, and once again he decided to do something about it. Leaving half of his force where it was, Nero led the other half of his men around the back of the Roman lines, all the way to the Carthaginian left flank. There he struck, surprising and outnumbering the Iberian troops, and sending the army into disarray. The Romans, now with a massive advantage, destroyed the Carthaginian left and center, and spooked the elephants, forcing many to be killed by their handlers, before totally encircling and killing the Gauls. Hasdrubal, realizing that he had been defeated and unwilling to be captured, charged the Roman forces on his horse along with his personal guard, and was killed. The Romans had won the day, and Rome was safe from a unification of the Barca brothers. When all was said and done, the casualties were high. While the real numbers are unknown, it is estimated that the Romans lost 2,000 men, compared to the Carthaginian death toll of 10,000. Of the elephants, six were killed by their handlers, and the remaining four were captured by Rome, along with about 5,400 Carthaginian soldiers. In Rome, the anticipation was extremely tense, as many had sensed the importance of the battle. When the good news finally came, quote, Rome was almost delirious with joy. So agonizing had been the suspense with which the battle's verdict on that great issue of a nation's life and death had been awaited, so overpowering was the sudden reaction of the consciousness of security and of the full glow of glory and success. Hannibal, meanwhile, had no such glory. After Hasdrubal was killed, Nero had his head cut off, 
and when he returned south to Hannibal's army, he had his head thrown into the camp. Hannibal was both personally and practically distressed, now robbed of his opportunity to take Rome as well as his brother. Allegedly, he was even heard to have said, now at last I see the destiny of Carthage plain. Over the coming years, the tides of the war would turn in Rome's favor. By 201 BC, Rome had invaded Carthage and the fateful Battle of Zama sealed the war, securing Rome as the power of the West. Nero and Livius would once again be elected together in 204 when they were put in charge of conducting the Roman census. However, without the unifying factor of an external enemy, the feud between the two boiled over, making both men inefficient at their jobs. Both men would go to their graves as rivals, Livius first, then Nero later on after a diplomatic mission to Macedonia. Over 50 years later, Carthage would refuse to pay the war reparations to Rome it still owed. In retaliation, Rome would once again invade Carthage, this time utterly destroying most of the city and killing most of its inhabitants, selling the rest into slavery. The salting of the fields by the Romans actually appears to be a myth, and while the siege of Carthage was brutal, it wasn't that brutal. Since the area later became part of Rome's empire, and it wouldn't make sense to render an agricultural breadbasket useless. Further, many of the monuments that were taken were eventually returned to the city. The impact of the Battle of the Metaurus River is hard to overstate. For one, it is likely that had Hasdrubal defeated the Romans there, he probably would have been able to retreat to friendly territory and open communications with his brother. The pair would be better able to communicate and fight the Romans, especially since Nero had weakened the southern Roman forces, and the two armies would be effectively annihilated. Hannibal could then probably wreak even more havoc against the now reduced southern Roman forces and strengthen his grip in the south. The pair would then eventually meet and move on Rome, likely taking the city or at the very least striking a mortal blow that would end the burgeoning republic in a matter of years. Had this happened, and Carthage had become the Mediterranean power, the world might be quite different. To understand how, we need to look at what Rome contributed to the world and how much of that would have been lost. While probably not as foundational to the West as Greece, Rome still contributed very important things to the world. There is of course the Latin language, which serves as the root for the languages of Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Romanian, as well as being a big part of the English language as well. Politically and socially, the Romans were champions of republicanism, even if this eventually was undone by Julius Caesar a couple centuries after the Punic Wars. Despite all that, even under the early emperors, Rome still had a powerful balance of powers, making it so that even the mighty emperors had to compromise with the Senate, a feat which most failed popular governments are never able to achieve. Ideas like the presumption of innocence, as well as other important legal doctrines were championed by the Romans. In short, the Romans continued the tradition of privileging substantial segments of the population with power, instead of just concentrating it in the hands of the few, which most every other civilization around the world has done. And if that's not enough for you, just think of all the Latin terms and notions we have in our language. A few examples include Semper Fi, Habeas Corpus, Carpe Diem, Alter Ego, etc., Post Mortem, and Versus. Socially, Rome was a more martial, conservative society. Hierarchy was important, and class distinctions were very strong, even if they were more fair than other societies. Discipline and rigorous work defined the Roman world, and concepts like this actually originally came out of it alongside more democratic ones, paradoxically. While of course some of these more conservative elements have very obvious downsides, these values in a society also allow it to organize and actually become a place worth living. Technologically, Rome was also responsible for concrete, aqueducts, c-sections, autopsies, and the massive road system that allowed them to effectively rule and travel within their realms. It also helped those who came after Rome to do the same, including the Ottomans, Franks, Visigoths, and the various Muslim caliphates. In short, this clip from Monty Python's The Life of Brian sums it up pretty well. And what have they ever given us in return? The aqueduct, the and the sanitation. And the roads. Well, yeah, obviously not roads. I mean, the roads go without sand, don't they? Irrigation. Medicine. Education. 
Yeah, yeah, all right, fair enough. And the wine? <laughs> Public baths. And it's safe to walk in the streets at night now, Reg. All right, but apart from the sanitation, the medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, a fresh water system and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? Brought peace? Oh, peace! Shut up! Secondly, we need to understand what Carthage would have contributed instead of that. If we start with politics, we can see that Carthage actually was a form of republic, much like Rome. While Rome's republicanism had an admittedly more fascistic flavor, Carthage's republicanism was stained with oligarchy. Instead of being more martial and conservative than Rome, Carthage was more interested in trade and exploration. If we assume that Carthaginian social attitudes permeated Western culture, we would assume that medieval Europe probably would have a better attitude towards commerce rather than relegating that sector to Jewish minorities. Additionally, these medieval Europeans may even have discovered the New World even earlier due to an increased exploratory ethic, which would have a very interesting effect on the world. The world would likely be more interconnected and capitalistic if Carthage won at the Metaris, but that also comes with some downsides. Chief among them, a society that branches out too much doesn't build itself up in the way that a more conservative society does. While Carthage would break down barriers around the world, it wouldn't build its own barriers up enough, which gets into my third point. Even if Carthage won at Metaris, the society probably wouldn't last nearly as long as Rome did. As we saw, Carthage relied heavily on mercenaries, which tend to be less effective than national armies as made obvious by the Punic Wars, as well as the plethora of examples in history where mercenary troops would switch allegiances if their patron ran out of money or if their opponent simply paid more. Even Machiavelli saw the issue with this 1700 years later. This, in conjunction with the general tendency for exploratory societies to stretch themselves thin, would probably mean that Carthage wouldn't last the millennium that Rome did and would likely fall to another society. From here it's hard to predict what the world would be like, but if the subsequent societies that Carthage influenced were the ones to rule Europe, I think it's safe to say that Europe would probably still be an economic powerhouse, but it wouldn't be sustainable and would undergo regular historic destabilization, probably causing other areas of the world to be the main superpowers. Think of areas like Sri Lanka or modern Vietnam and Cambodia who were very strong trading places but never became superpowers. Creasy actually sort of makes this point in relation to Carthage not really having a national spirit, instead investing all social identity and greatness into one man. Quote, It was clearly for the good of mankind that Hannibal should be conquered. His triumph would have stopped the progress of the world. For great men can only act permanently by forming great nations. And no one man, even though it were Hannibal himself, can in one generation affect such a work. But where the nation has been merely enkindled for a while by a great man's spirit, the light passes away with him who communicated it. And the nation, when he is gone, is like a dead body, to which magic power had, for a moment, given unnatural life. When the charm has ceased, the body is cold and stiff as before. So what else does Creasy have to say about the impact and implications of Metaris? Well, in typical 19th century fashion, he has some, let's say, not so politically correct things to say. Creasy essentially regurgitates an idea of the two principal races of mankind, the Semitic peoples and the Indo-Germanics. Creasy claims that the basic culture of these two groups is quite distinguishable, and makes the point that Semitic peoples such as Arabs, Jews, and Carthaginians are in the pursuit of industry, commerce, and navigation. The Indo-Germanics, consisting of Persians, Greeks, Romans, and Germans, meanwhile, have the spirit of heroism, art, and legislation. Of course, you can point out areas where he is correct here. The Jewish people, for example, tend to be very industrious and successful in any economic landscape they find themselves in historically, despite social and political oppression. Greek and Roman history, meanwhile, is filled with amazing art and the foundations of modern political systems. However, I think Creasy is fundamentally wrong in ascribing these characteristics to these groups separately. For one, you can point out that the characteristics don't apply well to every culture in the given group. Industriousness may apply to Jews, for example, but the Muslim world tends to be more martial and conservative historically. Arabs, especially during the Dark Ages, were also quite exploratory in terms of science, while the Jews were not as much. 
Further, you can point out that these characteristics apply to groups in both categories. The exploration of the Arabs was not dissimilar to the same scientific and mathematical exploration of the Greeks, and the strong religiosity of the Romans can be seen in Muslim cultures historically as well, especially today. But the main nail in the coffin for Creasy's comparison is that all of the attributes he assigns to both the Indo-Germanics and the Semitics apply to the Western world, despite it primarily only being founded by one of those groups. The Western world is extremely industrious and has led the world economically for centuries. The same can be said about the West's exploratory tendencies, both geographically and conceptually. The West has also produced amazing art, political systems, and general material well-being. In short, the traits that Creasy assigns to the others in his worldview are extremely applicable to the Western world that he lived in, and ultimately I think that's what makes the West so great. So while I do think that Carthage winning the Punic War would change the world massively, as I talked about earlier, it's not for the overly broad reasons that Creasy posits. In terms of how important I think this battle is compared to the others, I would say it isn't as important as some of the big ones, but still up there. Like Syracuse, the battle determined the character of the Western world, which, while important, isn't quite as important as allowing the Western world to exist in the first place. Two centuries later, Rome would be the power of the Western world, firmly in charge of everything around it. Like Athens did hundreds of years before, however, it would become greedy and attempt to monopolize Europe for itself. With a large-scale excursion into Germany, Rome would wage another battle that would decide the fate of the world as we know it today at the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. Thanks so much for watching this video guys. This one took a while to research and write, but I hope I did a better job with this one, especially with the conclusion piece. The next episode in this series is going to look at the Battle of Teutoburg Forest in 9 AD, and I can't wait to make that video for you guys as well. As always, remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more content. Let me know what you guys think of the Battle of the Metaris and how it should compare to other battles, and I will see everybody in the next one. Goodbye.